Well, that was a that was a big step for Micah tonight. Y'all know it. He did. I'm well pleased with him. <clears throat> well, what are we looking at, Levi, with the with the election? We have a new president. You think so? That's inauguration. Is it confirmed? Is it as have they has anybody publicly declared it yet? No. I try to keep up with it by the hour, see what the latest is. I think this is gonna get dragged out for weeks. This what happened last night was my worst fear as far as the way the possible ways it could go. I mean, you were hearing things about a landslide either way. I wouldn't have been surprised. I would have been okay with that. It just We would at least know. Or even if Trump had won by a narrow margin, I don't think it would have been as... I mean, maybe the his opposition would have been violent, but at least we would know something. This way, I think he's going to fight it tooth and nail, and it's just going to be dragged out, and it's not going to be pleasant whatsoever, but... We'll still meet, we'll still worship, we'll still continue on. I know God is in control. I know that uh, nothing escapes His vision. He knows all, He sees all. But it just breaks my heart to think that our election could be won under suspicious circumstances. And, And to think that we have people in high places who, who are potentially guilty of even attempting to do such. There have been a lot of suspicious activity, it would seem, over the last 24 hours with some of these votes in some of these counties. And I, whether it's true or not, we know that that's the way politics is played sometimes. And that breaks my heart. But but like I said, we don't worry. We're not going to give up. We'll keep on doing what we do. And even if the government tries to interfere, tries to intercede, we will put God first. So, hope that you'll be encouraged and, and not get too down about it. Anybody want to make any comments about it before we get into Proverbs? All right. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. That's fine. (laughs) Exactly. That's exactly right. Yep. It just, it's a fitting end, I think, to the year. It may not have an official announcement until. Who knows when? So, drag it out. It's going. It's just a a black eye to our our country, though. All right, uh, the book of Proverbs, uh, panoramic views of the Bible, is our book, and we're trying to go through each book and give a an overview. Just go through some of the high points of it. We've connected all of our books so far to one cohesive theme throughout Scripture, the idea of being redeemed from our past so we can be faithful in the present and have hope of eternity with God in heaven. And every book supplies something to that theme. Every book helps to add knowledge. Help it, it helps to add an understanding to us. When we study this book by itself, we dig deeply into it Every book should help to expand our understanding and our knowledge of God's salvation of mankind through Jesus Christ. Even books like Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, these books of poetry or wisdom, every book contributes something to that message of uh, salvation through Jesus Christ. And that's what we've tried to identify, try to pinpoint as we've been through these studies, but it's been... Uh, 
over eight months, and uh, we're going to have to get back into the, the swing of things, into the flow. And so we're going to begin tonight with the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is one of those books that, um, if you took Proverbs out of the Bible, it would still be relevant to any nation, any society, any uh, group of people who read it if they didn't attribute it to the Holy Spirit's inspiration of Solomon, if they didn't think of it as holy scripture. The book of Proverbs is still just good for anyone. It contains such wisdom, such common sense. And that's really the idea, I think, that Solomon's trying to portray here. The need for common sense, the value of practical wisdom. Uh, in the one sentence summary that I've tried to give you of each book so far, Proverbs is get back to the basics. Just plain, simple wisdom, common sense, facts about right and wrong, good and evil. That's what Solomon reveals here in the book of Proverbs. Again, to remind you, the writer of this book, um, Wyatt Sawyer, he seems to... It's not a deep study, and we know that. That's kind of why we're doing it, so we can move quickly and just get some of the high points. But sometimes some of his... The things that he draws out of the book make me question what he was thinking or why he chose that. And especially when you get into some of the questions. Um, but even in some of the, the outline and the... Um, the things that he lists over on the left side, the page on the left. He gives us the meaning of the word. Proverb is a, a wise saying, a maxim, or a ruling. And, and Solomon is known for his proverbs. How many proverbs did Solomon write? Like anybody can even know that. Do we know? 1 Kings 4, verse 32, gives us a number. He was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrahite, and Heman the Chal and Chalcol, and Darda, and the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in na all nations round about, and he spake three thousand proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five. 3,000 wise sayings, maxims, proverbs of Solomon. That number may be exact. It may be literal. It may be just a round estimation. I don't know. I know that according to my math, there's 915 verses in the book of Proverbs. So if he wrote 3,000, we don't have them all here. We know that People from all over the world came to seek the wisdom of Solomon and like the Queen of Sheba when she arrived, she said, the stories don't do it justice. Uh, the half has not been told, she said, of the wisdom that God had given to Solomon. So what he writes, what the Holy Spirit reveals here through Solomon is certainly um, the the. Stereotypes, not the word I'm looking for. The prototype of wisdom. It is the definition of wisdom. Because it comes from God. Because it is good for all. Because it is the truth. And that's what Solomon writes here. There are three writers identified in the book of Proverbs. Solomon, the main author, writes most of um, the book, chapter 1, verse 1, tells us that these are the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And then chapter 10, again, verse 1, uh, he says these are the Proverbs of Solomon. And there's a change there in kind of the format and the form of the, uh, of the, the Proverbs, the sayings. Uh, up until chapter 10, 
There's a, there's a lot more cohesion in the verses. Uh, specific topics addressed over a bigger amount of time, especially about wisdom and pursuing wisdom and about the strange woman in, verses, in chapters 1 through 9. But then in chapter 10, it changes and just starts going one verse after the other, rapid fire, short statements, and, and, uh, and they're more memorable that way. So maybe that's the reason for that statement in chapter 10, verse 1. Uh, these are the Proverbs of Solomon. But chapter 30 is the chapter that's attributed to Agur, the son of Jacob. Even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Ukal. I don't know anything about them. I don't know that anyone does. I have never read anyone try to identify who this is or... Um, uh, or what role he might have played. But it's contained here in the book of Proverbs. It's considered a canon. And um, there's no reason for us to question it. This chapter is, uh, is a very humble chapter. And it, it's full of the same kind of writing, the same kind of wisdom. Uh, very similar to some of the things that Solomon wrote. And then chapter 31 was written by Verse 1 says, King Lemuel. Uh, there's a possibility I've seen, I've, I've heard that that is another name for Solomon. I don't know, don't have any confirmation of that. Could be. Uh, but if he's a different person, uh, we, don't, we know that none of the kings of Israel, none of the kings of Judah were named Lemuel. But uh, maybe that's just a, another name for one of those men or maybe Solomon himself. But he writes um, that this was the prophecy that his mother taught him. And then, of course, in chapter 31, we have those great words about the virtuous woman. So those are the three writers of Proverbs. And since we attribute it mostly to Solomon, the date of writing, again, I have questioned his dates for just about every book because I don't know if he's trying to say this is the date when the book is written or the date uh, that the material covers, he says somewhere between 1012 and 970 B.C. I would put it a little later than that. That's about the time frame that I put David in and I would put Proverbs somewhere around 940 or 950 B.C. But I don't know what that really has much to do with anything when you're studying the book of Proverbs. We know who wrote it and when at least in relation to the other kings Solomon lived, uh, the actual date's really uh, extraneous. <clears throat> he says the purpose is to emphasize the proper, proper external religion for the Jews. And that's something to think about. Uh, the Jews' religion was indeed, in a large part, external. A lot of physical requirements, a lot of uh, sacrifices, a lot of blood that was offered... There was a lot of ritual and ceremony involved in Judaism um, by the command of God. And all of those things were to serve as a type or a shadow of the spiritual things that we do in the New Testament church. So their religion was indeed external to a large degree, but to say that the purpose of Proverbs is to emphasize the proper external religion, I don't know how that comes about. I don't know how he comes to that conclusion. And you think of any way that Proverbs emphasizes the external religion? If, if any books of the Old Testament emphasize the external religion, it would to, be, to me be like Deuteronomy and Leviticus that give those commands about how to make sacrifices and where to be on the feast days and what to do during the week and how to clean, cleanse themselves when they were unclean. Um, but to say Proverbs emphasizes proper external religion, I'm not sure how he comes to that conclusion. I think the purpose is more to show the simplicity of godly wisdom. The need for common sense. If a person lacks common sense, and it seems like so many today too do, especially since we're 
thinking about this political season, Proverbs is the place to get it. I know sometimes we think that that's something that's kind of innate in a person. It's natural. You either have it or you don't. You're either born with it or you just don't have access to it. But I don't, I'm not sure that's true. I think common sense can be learned. And it can be learned from Scripture. And you begin, if that's what you're seeking, in Proverbs. And, and it can be gained by anyone. And I think that's the purpose of it. To provide something in Scripture, to provide something in the Bible that appeals to all humanity. Um, the Muslims, the nation of Islam, they know their book as well, if not better than we do, those who are serious about their religion, and they can quote it, and they have a lot of those short statements, just those little pithy statements that uh, they have ready at a moment's notice. And that's what Proverbs was to the Jews, and it really should be for us even today. How many chapters are in Proverbs without looking real quick? 31. There's 31 days in several of our months. It works out nicely. You can read one chapter a day every month. Read Proverbs 12 times in a year. You've got those things down. They become very familiar to you. Start to memorize some of those statements and, and you have them then at a moment's notice ready to use. And I think that's more the purpose God wants to put something in, and it's not, <laughs> I don't think it's by accident, the order of the books that we find in the Bible. Uh, now I know that they're not necessarily written in that order. They're arranged by their uh, type and, and everything like that. But the books of poetry, these wisdom books, sometimes they, they're basically right in the middle of our Bibles. If you lay your Bible open flat, you're either usually going to be in Psalms or Proverbs. Right there in the middle of everything, God put this generic, simple, basic truth, wisdom that appeals to all. Even if you don't believe in, in God, in Jehovah, the God of Israel, there's so much to learn from Proverbs. And I think that has more to do with its purpose. Solomon, Solomon's appeal was worldwide in his rule during his reign. It wasn't just Israel, it wasn't just the Jews who were enthralled with Solomon and his glory and his splendor. Remember Jesus even says how glorious the rule of Solomon was. That um, He says that Solomon in all of his splendor was not arrayed like even the most simple flower. But truly... Solomon's appeal was global. And so his writings would appeal globally. The things that he writes are good for all. And I think that's more of the purpose, more of the idea behind Proverbs. Uh, I, I, it did, along with the Psalms, I suppose, provide something for them in their worship services, in their assemblies. The Psalms were the songs that they sang and and they could quote and they could chant these Proverbs. Um, and so in that way, it may have been a way to emphasize the proper external religion for the Jews. But I don't know that Solomon was writing these things for that purpose. To be used in worship. They, they serve for that function. But unlike the Psalms, uh, the Proverbs aren't written to be sung or, or in that same kind of uh, composition. David wrote some of those psalms as songs. They were meant to be sung. They have that, um, they have that, that format. But the Proverbs are just statements. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of juxtaposition in Proverbs, a lot of contrasts within the same verse. Uh, one thing and then it's opposite, kind of to give both sides of the same truth. Um, and those don't fit in songs as well, but they're easy to remember many times. And so uh, maybe that's where he was, the angle that he was coming from in saying that Proverbs emphasizes this proper external religion. But the, the, the main point is to, to find the wisdom that God provides for us. 
It's classified as a book of poetry, uh, wisdom. And again, it's not... Uh, Hebrew poetry is not like our poetry that necessarily rhyme. Hebrew poetry would be uh, either the first word or the first letter would start with all the same letter sound or they would uh, be in succession through the alphabet like in uh, Psalm 119. Those 22 blocks of eight verses are all... Um, broken up by the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And I believe each section begins with the first verse, the first word in each section starts with a consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet, if I'm not mistaken. But Proverbs isn't that way. It's just one idea after another. Sometimes two consecutive ideas will be completely unrelated. Sometimes they'll be connected by uh, one common theme, but... But you just have to keep moving. You have to stay with the flow. And, uh, and there's just so much. That's, that, I think that's the great thing about Proverbs. Because of the amount of content, the, the rapid succession of thought that we find here in this book, the depth is just unfathomable. You can continuously study Proverbs. You can dig as deep as you want. And there's always going to be more application that you make, there's always going to be more that you can draw from it. And that's what's so wonderful about Proverbs, so unique about it. Compares favorably to James in the New Testament. James actually um, uses several ideas from the book of Proverbs. And we haven't gotten to it yet, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it. But in every book, Brother Sawyer likes to point out, especially here while we're still in the Old Testament, New Testament references from this book and then uh, show some, some mentions in the New Testament from this book. It goes back and forth and sometimes they're not even the same ideas that he provides. But I want to go into, I, I think he does a disservice by just mentioning four uh, in each of those. Uh, and so I want to take a week Next week, before we even get to the questions, I want to take a week and do more of this. I want to look deeper. Uh, and I'm excited about this as a study I, I, I'm excited about doing now. I want to take a week to look at, especially New Testament references from the book of Proverbs. I think there are that many that we can, we can study that for a good while. I want to take at least a week. We'll just do one week of that. Um, but next week, we'll, we'll look at New Testament references and maybe even some Old Testament references back to the book of Proverbs. 31 chapters, he says, it'll take about an hour and 40 minutes to read it straight through. Um, key word is wisdom. Wisdom. Surely we can come up with some more besides wisdom. What would be some other key words from the book of Proverbs besides wisdom? It is on. Can you think of any? Can you hear me? Other key words from Proverbs. Knowledge. Knowledge. They're all going to be related to that idea. Wisdom, knowledge, what else? Righteousness. Okay, righteousness. I suggest to you understanding. And maybe truth. I did a study once um, from Proverbs about that phrase, the fear of the Lord. And it occurs four or five times, maybe more than that. I can't remember off the top of my head. That is a fascinating study. Um, one that really helps to, uh, to give a, a backdrop to the book of Proverbs. To give some tapestry 
that connects a lot of these ideas. That, that one phrase, the fear of the Lord. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, chapter 1, verse 7. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, there's several of them. And we might take a look at that at some point. We might do that sermon. Um, but uh, but that's the, uh, he says that's the lesson to this modern age. Now that's something I can completely agree with that he says here. If there is one thing that our modern age is lacking, it is a biblical fear of the Lord. Just, there's no knowledge of God. There's no acknowledgement of what He's done, His power, His presence. There's just a, a denial a public and a, a widespread denial of who God is and what He's done. And through all of the wisdom that Proverbs, that Solomon lays out in Proverbs, that's the idea that you should come away with. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of truth. It's the beginning of your search for the answers to the questions that you'll have in life. Here in, so in Proverbs, I believe Solomon was earlier in his life, maybe even before his heart was turned away by his wives, by those outlandish women. And I believe that was when Proverbs... Solomon wrote most of these Proverbs while his heart was still right with God. And it's about that time maybe when he's in his 30s maybe, 40s, late 20s, early 20s, when we start looking for those answers. We start questioning our existence. We start searching for meaning in life. And Solomon already had it. God granted unto him this miraculous wisdom. And he shares it with the entire world. The beginning of the answers to those questions is found here. And then when you get to Ecclesiastes and Solomon is older and he's been through it all and he's experienced loss and pain and futility, he kind of comes to the end of the answers to those questions. Why am I here? How did I get here? What's my purpose? Those deep philosophical questions. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes to me are the two places to find those answers. This is the beginning and Ecclesiastes is more like the end. So that phrase to me really does tie everything together in the book and it, it does... Uh, maybe express that appeal that Proverbs has to the whole world, to everyone. When you think about the truth, the basic common sense that is expressed here in Proverbs, you come to the conclusion this could only come from God. When you see what the source of Solomon's wisdom, the source of his knowledge, then it really should cause you to Consider who God is. The truth about His nature, about His personality. And once you open that door, it should lead you to a proper, wholesome, reverential fear of the Lord. So that phrase certainly is its appeal or its lesson to this modern age. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. All right, he gives you some of the main events in each of the chapters. What are some of the some of the verses or some you don't have to know the the chapter and the verse number, but what are some of the more memorable statements from Proverbs that you think about that come to the, your mind most frequently or or that you can just think of right now?
Okay, the virtuous woman in chapter 31. Virtuous woman. Her price is far above rubies. There's so many things. We preach that, that text so many times on Mother's Day. And, uh, it is a beautiful passage of Scripture. Okay? Virtuous woman. What are some other well-known phrases or well-known verses? Yep. I think that's 22 verse 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, that's one that... We need to be teaching and preaching on the public square today. Train up a child. So much of Proverbs is about that. Um, because as he goes through uh, revealing these things, he often addresses his son. My son, do this, don't do this. My son, if you want to have this, this is the way you act. My son is how he addresses his readers. Now whether he's literally writing to his son or if he's just calling the younger and... I mean, anyone was less wise than Solomon, so anyone could be considered his son in that regard. So whether he's using that literally or, or figuratively, that's the idea. There's a lot that's contained in Proverbs that's addressed towards the younger, the younger generation and in the, to the parents raising those, that younger generation. So that verse is one that we especially remember. 22.6 Train up a child in the way that he should go. What are some others? A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I don't know what verse that is, but that 17, 17, that's one that we know. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine right there in chapter 17. Broken spirit dryeth the bones. I think my mom, when she, when, I think she had a, a, an embroidered thing. Or, I don't know the difference between embroidery or cross stitch or whatever. But she had something that was handmade that had that verse on it. The merry heart doeth good like a medicine. One that we think of politically. What's the verse? But sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalteth the nation. One that's used multiple times in Proverbs that we can quote. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. How about pride goeth before Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. That's the one. To me, that's one of the more well-known. So, there's a lot of verses that are not just known by us, but there's a lot of verses in Proverbs, a lot of ideas here that the world is familiar with. Uh, that some of our sayings and some of our common uh, phrases might be modeled over modeled against, uh, might have their origin in some of what we read here in Proverbs. So we know that there's so much that's um, digestible. And I think that's the point of it. To give us something that we can commit to memory, something that we... Remember, the Jews didn't have this. They didn't have a portable, compact, um, well-bound book that they could carry around with them. They had to memorize these things. They had to know them by heart. And that's why they are in the form that they are. So it makes sense that we should be able to do that as well. So many memorable verses. Uh, let's see. We don't have time really to get to the questions. There's one... Uh, 
There's a lot of basic common sense, a lot of simple wisdom that is good, but it's not all positive. It's not all um, optimistic. Proverbs is well balanced. It contains as much um, warning as it does encouragement, as much um, admonition. Is that, I guess admonition could be good or bad, but it, it contains as much negative as it does positive. And especially as Solomon is attempting to warn his readers, the younger generation, his son, about the strange woman, the harlot, the, uh, the loose woman, as we might say. There's so much, especially in the early part of the book, that he deals with that, and to me that's ironic. He gives so much warning about that, about her, about that way, and then he himself fell prey to it. And, um, and one lesson that we learn from the life of Solomon then is that no matter how smart we are, no matter how wise we are, no matter how much knowledge we possess, living it out is very different. Being able to teach it, preach it, say it is one thing. Being able to live it is something different. We see in Proverbs a, a picture of what could have been in the life of Solomon. And, and if we live by it, if we take this to heart, we commit it to leading us and guiding us in our walk, we could end up living a better life than Solomon did. I believe that Solomon came back to the Lord at the end of his life, um, but between Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, there is this life of debauchery, a life of wastefulness, a life of vanity. And we can avoid it because of what Solomon writes for us. That's the wisdom that's contained in Proverbs and then in Ecclesiastes. All right, so next week we will look at uh, some references back to the book of Proverbs, especially from the New Testament. Then we'll get to the questions and we'll start moving after that. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the blessings of it. We're thankful for all who have come out tonight and we pray that our, our study tonight and our time together will edify us, will build us up and we pray that we'll be better, we'll be better equipped to live the Christian life from this day forward. We ask you'll forgive us of our sins and watch over those that we know of who are hurting and suffering and those who are sick. Be with our elderly and our shut-ins and we pray your richest blessings upon them all. We pray for our nation tonight, Father, that we might have unity and that we might have resolution soon. We pray that no matter what the outcome might be, we pray that we will uh, be the example in our communities, that we will set uh, the light of your truth before those around us and that we will demonstrate that we trust you in all of the goings-on in our nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.